So, uh, as usually, good morning and welcome to the final lecture of the discrete mathematics course. Today, we'll um, discuss uh, the sharp P class and uh, problems of um, uh, the problems of counting related to NP problems. So, um, I will share the slides which I prepared for today, and we'll start. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I hope everyone sees the slides both on Zoom and in class. So, uh, sharp P, the counting problems. So, we start, we recall the definition of the NP class. Uh, and there are several equivalent definitions, as you remember. So, you can define it using non deterministic computations, you can define it using um, hints or witnesses. Also. Don't know that. So, we'll use definition two with the hints. And uh, if you have a decision problem A of X, then uh, you, what is a decision problem? So a decision problem takes an input and returns zero or one. So the output is just one bit of information. And the input, well, we can see that it is also encoded as a binary string. So we can say that X is a word of zeros and ones. So we have many words as the input and we have many bits as the input and one bit as the output. This is the decision problem. And well, it is said to be polynomially decidable if there just exists a deterministic polynomial time algorithm for solving it. And also we call it uh, NP if uh, the following holds. So A of X is called NP. If there, if and only is, is in NP, it means that A of X should return one. If and only if there exists such a y that its polynomial size with respect to x, q is a polynomial, and uh, some relation between x and y holds. And this relation is polytime decidable. So the standard example, I don't know, Hamiltonian cycle. So a graph has a Hamiltonian cycle and or not, and we have to decide it. So x is the graph, and we decide whether there exists a Hamiltonian cycle inside. And uh, this uh, problem is in NP. Why? Because if we take this cycle as a witness, as a hint, then of course the size of the cycle is polynomial with respect to the size of the graph. It's just linear. And also there is a polynomial time computable relation between the graph and the cycle inside it, which decides whether this cycle is correct. So the algorithm should not guess the cycle, it should only check whether the cycle is really a Hamiltonian cycle. So whether this Y really encodes the cycle and this cycle is a Hamiltonian one, so it traverses each vertex exactly once. This is all checked in polynomial time. But without this hint, the problem becomes hard. We don't know how to decide whether such a cycle exists unless we're given this cycle. Well, we can do brute force. And therefore, NP belongs to X time. So if you can solve something in uh, NP, then you can also solve it, solve it deterministically without any hints using exponential time, just brute forcing all the possible hints because the number, the size of hint is limited by a polynomial. Therefore, the number of possible hints is just exponential with respect to the length of the input bit. But this is the NP class. So, and also let us check that this condition also inside R. So we suppose that R just refuses to accept any long hints. This is a technical thing that we, have, we can remove this from uh, the definition. So we just say that um, all the checks that the hint is small, that the hint is bounded by the given polynomial Q is done inside our check. So if we, again, given a graph, we try to put in a very long cycle, it just says, no, 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 this is bad. It could not be Hamiltonian and I will not accept it. So this is just a technical remark. It will be more convenient for us to think. Why is the hint? And it is given to someone by the angel to help us solve the problem. So there are the examples. So we already discussed the Hamiltonian cycle, but also the satisfying problem for Boolean formulae. We have this satisfying assignment. Today at the practical class, we'll also uh, talk about uh, coloring problems for graphs. And well, last time we talked about two coloring. This time we will talk about three coloring. Again, 
the coloring of the graph. So the graph should be colored in a correct sense. That means that uh, neighbor vertices should be of different colors. Again, the correctness of a coloring is checked trivially, is checked polynomially, but guessing the coloring can be hard. Okay. So let's go a bit beyond. Um, well, also did it uh, one of the lectures. So the decision problem says well, there exists a Y, which we call a witness now, such that this. So the existence problem that uh, we ask whether something exists for a given X. For example, satisfy an assignment for Phi, this will be a running example. So um, we could ask for all witnesses. And uh, as we discussed before, the, the uh, algorithm could run with polynomial delays. So the total number of witnesses could be exponential. It's OK. But uh, we could ask for polynomial delay uh, for the production of witnesses. So the search problem, we, ha we have to yield just one witness or say no, there is no one. So these two problems are, in a sense, more general than the decision problem. Once we solve this or this, we immediately solve the decision problem. Because if we get one witness, then we can just forget about that and re just return one. And if we return all the witnesses, again, we wait for the first one and return one. If the algorithm stops without yielding any witnesses, we return zero. And finally, the problems which we're going to discuss today are the counting problems. And they call the sharp P class is the problems of yielding the number of witnesses. So how is, what are the terminology here? So we have an NP problem, which is called A. To each NP problem, we associate a counting problem, which we call sharp A which is the corresponding problem, but it has also to count the number of witnesses, not only to uh, answer yes or no. So the, again, the counting problem is a more general thing than uh, in the NP decision problem, because if we can count the number of witnesses, then we can compare that this number with zero. And if this number is zero, we return no, and if it is not zero, we return one. So the counting problem is hard. Well, not easier in a sense. So a priori, as I said, the decision problem is the easiest one. If we can solve the search accounting problem, we can get a solution for the decision problem with the same R. So we, the same R gives us a decision problem, a search problem, and a counting problem. And search problems actually are not harder than the decision one. So we mm. had this example last time. Uh, so this is the statement that if P equals NP, then any search problem is solvable in polynomial time. And we proved it actually. So for example, we take SAT. So if we can do it for SAT, we can do it for anything else because it is a complete problem. And searching for SAT can be done by dichotomy. As we remember that we first check satisfiability, then we take the first variable, we make it zero. Again, check for satisfiability. If it's not satisfiable, we take one. Then look at the second variable again, we try zero and one. And uh, this um, reduces the search problem to n instances of uh, the decision problem. So if the decision problem is polynomial, then also the search problem is polynomial. And the sharp P class is a counting corresponding to NP decision problem. And the thing we're going to discuss today is that counting problems can be harder than the corresponding decision one. Well, in the presupposition that P is not equal to NP, of course. If P, if P is equal to NP, everything is polynomial, nothing interesting happens. But uh, if P is not equal to NP. And this is the theorem. This is the theorem I'm not going to prove today, but I just show it as an example. We're going to prove it another one. So we have the problem two set. Satisfiability for two CNF. The decision problem is NP is P. We know that, right? Because we have resolution procedure and it's polynomial if we have only two um, uh, literals in each clause. But the counting problem, as we'll show, it's not solvable in polynomial time unless P equals NP. So we cannot, if P is not in P, then we cannot uh, present an algorithm which will uh, count the number of satisfying assignments for a given two series. So this is the theory, counting problems are hard. 
So in order to prove theorems like this, we have to develop a theory of sharp P completeness. So again, you see here that NP completeness is not sufficient for proving theorems of this sort. Because if we, uh, well, if we prove that something is NP complete and P is not equal to NP, then of course the corresponding decision problem is hard. It's not polynomial time solvable. And therefore the counting problem is also hard because it's harder, it's uh, uh, more general than the decision. But here, uh, this two set as a decision problem is polynomial. So we don't have any um, hope to prove it's NP hardness unless P equals NP. Therefore, this problem is somewhat independent from two set, it's harder, and we'll have to invent another theory of hardness for such problems. And it's called sharp P complete. So as in theory of NP completeness, we base on M reductions, one to one reduction. The theory of sharp P completeness is based on counting reductions. So what is a counting reduction in basic? Um, counting reduction, it, so the M reduction is one function. Yep, I will let me just quickly draw it just as a comparison. So, um, mm -hmm. So we say that A is M reducible in polynomial time to B. What does this mean? There is a function F, which F, okay, we can say that it is function on words or on inputs, input data. And this function works, so it's polynomial. So I will say it is FP, it's function polynomially computable. And we say that X, A of X, equals one if and only if uh, b of f of x equals one. So we reduce a to b in the following way. If we wish to answer the question for a, we compute a function from x to another y, and then we ask the question to b, and b returns us the answer. The answer is used as the correct result. So uh, we cannot do anything with this answer. Well, we have nothing to do actually. We can either keep it or flip it, right? If we have just a bit, if we just replace it with a constant, it's, it's meaningless. So we, either we keep it or we replace it with the dual one. So if we keep it, then we'll get the NP hard problem. If we flip it, then we'll go to the class co NP. As we can say, reduce um, satisfiability to tautology. So tautology is going to be hard. Okay, so um, now about the counter reduction. The counter reduction includes two functions. The first function is the function f on input data. Sigma is just zeros and ones. And the second is the function on counts of the results. And the following should hold. So recall that these are counting problems. So this means that A of X is the number, this is the cardinality of the set, the number of elements here, the number of such Y's that this holds. Recall that this checks that Y is polynomial. So this is always a finite set. And this is just a natural number. And the same for B, which was another R. And we say that uh, this is a reduction if the following holds. So how do we reduce the counting problem for A to the counting problem for B? We wish to count the number of witnesses for A. Instead of doing that, we first uh, modify our input data. Instead of X, we calculate F of X. Then we solve the question for F of X, the B question. But sharp B gives us not just zero or one. It gives us a natural number, a count. And then we are allowed to modify this count also as a natural number. So um, what does it mean to be polynomial or the natural number? That means to be polynomial on the size of the uh, data which is used to represent this number, so which is logarithmic number. Otherwise, we can do many things if we're polynomial with this number. So this reduces sharp A to sharp B, because if we know how to solve sharp B, then using this formula, we can solve sharp A with a polynomial delta. So if we know to have how to solve sharp B in polynomial time, 
then we first do f of x, then do this, and then compute g. So all this is done in polynomial time. This yields a natural number, and then we we'll apply g. So the theory of sharp p completeness is actually absolutely dual to the theory of uh, np completeness. So we say that a problem sharp b, a counting problem with sharp p complete, if we have for any other sharp p problem a, we have the reduction. This is just exactly as in p complete. So we can develop the theory of sharp p complete problems, which is parallel to the theory of np complete problems. So how could it work? First, we have to obtain at least one of them. And for that, we'll uh, define a notion of parsimonious reduction, which is a specific case of counting reduction. It's the case when g is an identity function. So the reduction is done as follows. We take the um, uh, input data for A, we modify it by function F, then we solve the counting problem, problem for B, and exactly the answer of this algorithm is given as the answer to A. So we're not allowed to modify the count after we have computed. And a parsimonious reduction is also a specific kind of M reduction, because if g of n is n, then in particular g of 0 is 0. Therefore, it keeps 0. So this means that if you solve b, you, if you solve it as sharp b, you actually solve it as a decision problem, right? And this solution is kept as the result. So g of 0 is 0, and g of non-zero is non-zero. Therefore, the decision problem gets kept. It conveys the answer to the decision problem. The reductions which are used in cook levin theorem, which we proved, uh, at one of the lectures, are parsimonious. So indeed, uh, how part cook levin worked? So I will just recall it in a step. So in cook levin we say that the sequence of configurations of protocol of, a, of machine A on input X is encoded as a binary matrix. In size. Uh, please mute yourself if you are not speaking because it adds some noise here. So um, I will construct a formula with these variables, which expresses the fact that the matrix represents the correct protocol of execution. And this is how it is done in gist. So all expressible by Boolean formulae. And uh, the trick is that each satisfying assignment for this problem, for this formula, is exactly a winning trajectory in the execution of the non-deterministic algorithm A. So it's exactly one hint. So this means that um, satisfying assignments are in one-to-one -one correspondence with uh, hints for A. Therefore, this gives a reduction of uh, an NP problem A or a sharp P problem A, the corresponding sharp P problem, to SAT, which keeps the number of uh, the assignments. So the number of assignments in SAT is the same as the number of hints in A. So this says that any uh, problem is any sharp p problem is redu counting reducible parsimonious reducible to counting version of sat and therefore the counting version of sat is np a sharp p complete so sat is np complete and dually the, sh the sharp version is sharp p complete but to in order to prove this we had to establish the fact that this is um parsimonious that the number not only the existence of the satisfying assignment represents the existence of the hint in a also, the number of hints is the same as number of sets. So next, Satan's transformations, which are represented here, as you remember them. So these are Satan's transformations. For a formula, which is arbitrary, we construct, a, well, this is not a 3CNF, but it's like a 3CNF, which, is, which has T1, T2, T3, T4. And this is equisatisfiable with this one. Is Satan transformation, then we'll replace this with this. This is just equivalent, so this is nothing special. Okay. What happens here? So, if we have a satisfying assignment for this formula, it yields exactly one satisfying assignment for this formula, right? Because just these were this PQR are a subset of these variables, but also purely if we manage to satisfy the original formula, then the values for TIs are just automatically obtained because these equivalences say that T1 should be this, T2 should be this, and finally T4 should be true because the whole formula is true. Should satisfy. So therefore, uh, Satan's transformations are also parsimonious. 
each satisfying assignment of the original formula is represented by exactly one satisfying assignment of the three CNF. It's not equivalent, but equisatisfiable, and the number of satisfying assignments is still the same. So, because values of TIs are restored to me. Thus, counting problem for three set is also sharply complex. So for ham path, our reduction for Hamiltonian path, unfortunately, is not possible. So the reason why is the following, that here you will have these gadgets, as you remember from the last lecture. And while traversing this gadget, if uh, CJ includes uh, this value Xi in a positive version, then you can traverse it on the green path like that. If you remember. So in each satisfying assignment, you have to traverse these vertices for CJ. But suppose you have a satisfying assignment and inside your CJ you have two literals which are true. Then you have a choice. You can either traverse it on uh, the path on the gadget which is, corresponds to the first literal or to the second literal. So this means that for one satisfying assignment you will get two or more Hamiltonian paths. So the existence of the Hamiltonian path here encodes the existence of the satisfying assignment, but uh, the number of Hamiltonian paths can be more than the number of the satisfying assignment. So this is for our reduction is not parsimonious. And therefore we didn't yet prove that, uh, haven't yet proved that the, number, the counting problem for Hamiltonian path is sharply complete. But there also exists a parsimonious reduction, which is a bit more complicated. It was done by Zeta in uh, text. So even for specific sorts of graphs, you have a parsimonious reduction. So the counting problem for Hamiltonian path is also sharply complete. But if you use only parsimonious reductions and try to establish sharp P completeness using them, so this is actually meaningless. Why? Well, because if a counting problem is proven to be sharp P complete, and this is done by parsimonious reductions, then these parsimonious reductions are also M reductions, right? And therefore, we get that the decision problem is NP complete. Therefore, if P is not equal to NP, which is highly likely, as we know, we know that even the decision problem is not polynomially solvable. Well, nothing to say about the counting version. Counting version is harder. So therefore, if we prove sharp P completeness using only parsimonious reductions, we do not gain anything. We do not get any, say, new interesting information here. We just prove that problems are hard while they're, even their decision versions are hard. So we have to use more general counting reductions, and this could give us interesting results. And interesting cases, of course, include situations when the decision problem is polynomially decidable, while the counting problem is hard. So our example, famous example, is true set. The theorem which we uh, formulated at the beginning of this lecture, which says that uh, true set itself is polynomially decidable as a decision problem. Also, the search problem is polynomially solvable, as we know by dichotomy. But counting version of two sat is sharp P complete. We shall not give this proof because it's technically hard. It's sharp P complete. And if you wish to see the following two papers, which give this uh, reductions of sharp P completeness. The, some of this, one of these reductions will not be parsimonious. So they reduce uh, the permanent problem, which is like the determinant of a matrix, but without changing the sign. This is a sharply complete problem, and by due two reductions, we do this. So I just re refer to these papers if you're interested in detail. The idea is that there are reductions. And we shall consider the following easier example, which is the DNF set. So DNF set is the satisfiability problem for uh, disjunctive normal form. And uh, as we know, uh, the decision problem for DNF set is polynomial, right? Because a DNF is a disjunction of clauses. 
Satisfying the DNF is just satisfying one of them because the disjunction is satisfied if at least one is true. Therefore, we can just check each of the clauses. And now a clause is a conjunction of literals. And a conjunction is always satisfiable unless uh, there is a contradiction. So if inside the conjunction we have both P and not P, then it's not satisfiable. If we don't have such situation, then it is satisfiable. Just we see inside the conjunction which values should be uh, associated to variables. And if a variable is not present in the conjunction, then it can be satisfied by an arbitrary uh, value. So this is a polynomial time algorithm. We just try first. If it is contradictory, try the second. Let's say this is linear in the, in the, in the size of the DNA. But as we can see from this consideration, we already understand that the. Mm, yeah, please turn off, off the mic here because some, some, something happened here. So uh, we shall uh, consider an easier example, mm, uh, which is uh, the, uh, the DNF test. I think I can. I think I, I, think I can just mute him. Yeah. I just muted this guy. Okay. Yeah. So uh, for DNF sat, as we can see that it's, it's the uh, search problem, well, the search problem is reduced to the uh, decidability problem again by dichotomy, as usual. But uh, here we already see that the counting problem is not that easy. Because how do we count satisfying assignments? Now it is not sufficient just to consider one clause because uh, we have some satisfying assignments for the first clause, we have some satisfying assignments for the second clause, but these sets of course can intersect. So, so one assignment can satisfy both and next we have to count them and this looks like the same as counting the, this for CNF because for CNF we have to count the intersection, here we have to count the union, the size of the union. Yeah. So, this DNF set could be harder, and it exactly is. And let's see the following. So this is the counting reduction for CNF set to DNF set. So uh, yeah, let me write down the expression for that. So we're proving that. Um, the counting problem for CNF sat is counting polynomial reducible to that one of DNF sat. And the counting reduction is as follows. So here we see this reduction. K is the number of variables. So yeah, let's uh, take a small glance of that. Why should this work? Well, we just replace phi with not phi. So recall that phi is a CNF. So we're trying to solve this counting problem for CNF sat and reduce it to DNF sat. So phi is a CNF. We take the negation of phi and transform it into a DNF. And then we count the number of satisfying assignments here and then just replace it with 2k minus n. So what is 2 power k? 2 power k is the number of the total number of assignments, right? Because we have k variables, for each we have 0 or 1. Yeah. And then we just flip. So uh, why does this work? So we have two things we have to consider. So first, the set of satisfying assignments for phi is the complement of that set for not phi, right? So each satisfying assignment for phi is a non-satisfying assignment for the negation. So this means that if we have n assignments for not phi, then the number of assignments for phi is th this one, 2k, 2 to the power of k minus n, right? Great. So uh, this means that indeed this uh, modification of the counter does the job for uh, counting the number of satisfying assignments for phi. And now the only thing we have to uh, consider is the uh, polynomiality of these translations. So it's indeed a reduction. So we can reduce CNF set to DNF set as a counting problem just by taking the negation 
and then by um, uh, how to say this by um, re replacing the number with this complement using this function g. Now about polynomiality of this transformation. Well, g is of course polynomial because two to the power of k it has k digits. It's one zero 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 and it's small and we just subtract. It's a polynomial time operation. What about f? If phi is a conjunctive normal form with a CNF, then its disjunctive normal form of, uh, of its negation is polynomially computable. Why? Well, because a negation of a CNF is essentially a DNF, right? So we just do De Morgan and we propagate our negations inside. And by De Morgan, we get a DNF. This is absolutely polynomial. So again, in general, translation from uh, a uh, formula to a DNF could be exponential. And moreover, the size of the DNF could be exponential. And if you have a small CNF, then for example, it's perfect DNF is usually very big because it's dual, you have the dual sets of assignments. But if you have a formula which is in CNF and you just negate it, then translating to DNF is very easy. You just take a uh, the negation, you move it inside and your conjunctions become disjunctions, your disjunctions become conjunctions and uh, the big disjunction becomes a big conjunction and inside each clause you will have disjunctions. So this will become a, yeah, so, yeah, it will become a DNF. Big, big one is disjunction. And therefore, this is a counting reduction, as I said, and this uh, problem is sharp P complete. So now we have a corollary. So yeah, it's sharp P complete. That means that, well, what means sharp P complete? It means that it is, in an intuitive sense, it is hard, right? But uh, what does this exactly mean? The corollary is as follows, that if P is not equal to NP, then this problem is not polynomially solvable. Don't have a polynomial time algorithm, which given a DNF returns the number of satisfying assignments. So this is the, answer to this question in a sense. Well, how to prove this corollary? Because uh, if um, DNF sat were uh, polynomial at a time solvable as a counting problem, then using the counting reduction, we could reduce CNF sat as a counting problem to DNF sat as a counting problem. So if uh, so if this could be polynomially time solvable, then this would be also polynomially time solvable. But if we can solve the counting problem in polynomial time, we can also solve the decision problem in polynomial time because we just run the same algorithm and then we uh, just compare the number with zero. If the result is zero, then uh, we say no. If the result is one, then we say yes. If the result is not zero, we say yes. But this would imply that P equals not NP because by Satan transformation, we have uh, that CNF sat, even three CNF sat is NP, NP hard. So therefore we would imply P equals NP. So intuitively, well, we can do without all these fancy words about sharp P completeness. The actual idea is as follows. So we have this reduction here and how does it work? Well, essentially, well, suppose that we can solve the counting for DNF set. Then how to, uh, so we have this, now we have phi, which is a CNF. We have not phi, and we take compute the DNF of that, which is computed easily. So we can say that phi is I'll draw it. I think I will just stop sharing it and open a white screen just for, for, for convenience. Sake. So we can say that we have formula phi, which is in CNF. And we can say that um, phi is satisfiable if and only if the number of satisfying assignments for not phi is strictly less than two to the power of k, right? 
because this means that the number of satisfying because the number of satisfying assignments for phi plus the number of satisfying assignments for not phi it is always two to the power of k and therefore if this one is less than two to the power of k then this one is greater than zero and this means that we reduce the problem of satisfiability for c and f to problem of counting the satisfying assignments for its negation and uh, the negation uh, is so and ne next we have that not phi is uh, virtually the same as is dnf just by the model so this means that if we have this uh, counting version then we can reduce we have a polynomial reduction of the um, CNF set to the counting of DNF set. So this means the DNF set is hard, and unless p equals np, it is not polynomial at all. So the um, gist of uh, today's lecture is that counting problems, the counting number of uh, satisfying assignments, is harder than uh, just deciding whether such an assignment exists or counting the some something something something. So uh, you can find in literature many other examples like the Euler paths. Again, finding whether there is at least one Euler path, it is easy polynomial time solvable. You have to check that the graph is connected, and you have to check that uh, uh, all the vertices except maybe two have a degree which is even. Uh, you can do also a search problem, which is just to find at least one Euler cycle. Again, easy, but uh, how to um, count the number of uh, Euler cycles in a graph, this can be hard. It's a short, sharply hard problem. Also, uh, another example, which we discussed one of the times, that we have two coloring, and we know that uh, two coloring is basically the same as two sets. So our graph is, um, and this is parsimonious, by the way. You can do it parsimoniously. So this means that uh, a graph is too colorable. It is the same as the graph is bipartite. So the graph is, uh, let me just maybe clear that. So we have that the graph is too colorable. The same as bipartite. So this is uh, corresponding to to sat, and we can make it parsimonious. So we can encode the colorings of the graph as a satisfying of a Boolean formula. And moreover, we can do it. I think we didn't do it. But let's do it now. Uh, how to reduce satisfying to sat to graphs? So um, we have. Um, so what is a 2CNF? It is in a 2CNF we have say P or Q and for example not P or R etc. And we can say that uh, well oh, it, it, it's not that easy to do it here but we can do it like that. So we can introduce two sets of vertices so we have vertices for say blue ones for well they will not this is not the coloring I'll not let all of them be black because otherwise we'll, it's p q r and here is not p not q not r and we have that p or q is um should be satisfiable that means that we cannot have not p and not q right that this, uh, they cannot be both of one color, say. So we can connect these. And here also not P and R. So this will be not exactly the two coloring. It will be um, in uh, what they call, no, they will be a, what they call an independent set, which we'll discuss today. So independent set says that uh, these should be 
can, this should be outside. So this at least this should not be an edge inside. So um, this one is um, not P or R. So either P should be outside or not R. So it should be like that. And also, also set. So, and we're finding an independent set. So we're finding an, a set which does not have any vertices inside of uh, size k. And here we also do this because we are not allowed to have both p and not p. So this independent set of size k, it should include only uh, the vertices which do not, are not connected. And for example, we can do it like this. We can take this, we can take this, and we can take this, for example. These are independent. Or we could also take this. So an independent set is a set which does not include any edges inside. And therefore, we can say that um, it's not about coloring, sorry, it's about um, independent sets. So we can say that, yeah, each independent set is in one to one correspondence with uh, uh, the, what they call it, two, uh, two, 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 two CNF. So it means that the counting problem for two set is. Uh, Counting polynomial reducible to the independent set problem. And this in an independent set in a very specific graph. So this problem for such sort of graphs is generally polynomial as is reducible to two set. But in general, it's also in pick complete. This means that we have in p hardness, uh, sharp p hardness, and this is not. Um, polynomial at a time doable. So um, that's about all for uh, this accounting problems. So uh, we still have uh, something like half an hour at just the end of today's lecture and I would like to uh, finish the course and finish this lecture with an overview of what we have discussed during the course. So uh, what we actually started with. So here we had this running central example, which is the uh, world of propositional logic. Or Boolean formulae. So we denoted them by Greek letters. So the formula phi included variables, I don't know, p1, pn. And there was an assignment, which is a function alpha from variables to zeros and ones. So these propositional variables in classical, so it's classical propositional logic. In the classical understanding of logic, each propositional variable, each letter, will let's call them PVAR propositional variables. Uh, each propositional letter is a, uh, a denotation for a, an atomic elementary statement. And this statement is either true or false. And classical logic is the logic of some mm, very high, highly sitting person who knows everything that for each variable, for each elementary fact, we know whether it is true or false. So this is as opposed to non-classical logics in which we can have some intermediate things, like we don't know, for example. So something say, does it rain in St. Petersburg right now? So the fact that it rains in St. Petersburg right now, it is an atomic statement from the general perspective it's either true or false, but sitting now here, we do not know whether it's true or false. So there are two assignments in one of these, this variable is 
true and the other one is variable is false. But we are looking from this bird eye view what we know everything about traffic. So next, the formula phi was constructed from these variables also from constants. So there's a constant, which is a constant for zero, constant for one. Also we had implication, um, negation, disjunction, conjunction, maybe equivalence. So these are all Boolean for me. Actually, it is sufficient to have uh, a basis. So for example, if we have false and we have implication, everything else is uh, expressible. You can express negation as implication to false. True is not false. Disjunction is uh, not A implies B. And then conjunction is by De Morgan. And this is a conjunction of two implications. So this is the basis. But we can have a big range. So this is sufficient. So next we will say that uh, given an assignment on variables, we can propagate it to formulas. So we have alpha, we, we use alpha with that. I don't want to use the bar because it's like negation. It's like alpha with like hat. Well, hat is like conjunction, but so it's like you, you can use the tau here. That was also like negation. Mute the people who are using their mics now, and uh, I will share it again. Oh. So let, let it be a with the head of a formula. It's also uh, an element of zero and one, and is computed by truth tables, as we all know. Okay, no, so. Uh, we can say that alpha is a satisfying assignment. For phi, if alpha of phi is one. So we manage to introduce such um, uh, values for our variables that the formula became true. That's great. So now we um, go further and we um, consider that the A, so we have satisfiable. This means that there exists a satisfying assignment. Satisfying assignment. And it is tautology, a given formula, of course, if for all any assignment is satisfying. So dual notions, and we recall that this will be needed for us during the whole course, that phi is satisfiable. So we can say like this, not phi is satisfiable, if and only if phi is not So next we discuss the CNF and DNF, conjunction and disjunction normal form. We discussed it much today, so I will not recall the definition. And uh, then we started discussing algorithmic properties. So uh, what algorithms are used for guessing satisfiability or for guessing tautology? And we uh, notice the following things that the first one that satisfying for DNF belongs to P. By the way, we can do by duality that for CNF, what problem for CNF is belongs to P? Totally. Because if you take a CNF, then its negation is virtually a DNF. And then if we want to check whether CNF is a tautology, we translate it into a dual formula, which is negation, which is a DNF, check whether it is satisfiable, and then just flip our results. So if the result was yes, then we say no, no, then yes. So another example that we had this three set or this three CNF set, oh no, two CNF sets first. Okay. 
Oh, this can be done as two set. It is just the same, just another, another name for that. A two set is the satisfiability problem for two set. It's satisfiability. So the question is whether there exists a satisfying assignment, at, at least one. So we don't ask for the number of them or something. Okay, so now we go further. So uh, we know that two sat belongs to P. What about three sat? Satisfiability for three CNF, or what about sat in general, which is satisfiability for arbitrary formulae? So these are problems which are quite useful. For example, you can reduce, uh, say, two coloring to two CNF or three coloring to this CNF. We'll discuss it in a little bit later. later. Mm. But people tried to solve these guys and they uh, didn't manage to do this. And uh, therefore, but they could not also prove that they are not polynomial. And for this, the theory of NP completeness was invented. So the theory of NP class and NP completeness. So this is an element of general theory of algorithms. We had to prove that under some conditions, this problem is not polynomial. So therefore, we had to formalize our notion of being polynomially solvable. So while we proved things like the first statement, this, we actually didn't uh, have to introduce any formal notion of computation, right? So we were allowed just to speak informally that we can write a program on a program in language that runs in a reasonable time. A number of steps is bounded by a polynomial on the, of the size of the input. So this was just a um, general thing. But when we're trying to discuss that something is hard, that something is hard to solve, then we have to formally formulate the notion of polynomiality. And the notion of polynomiality is given by a Turing machine. So here we had to talk about Turing machines. The Turing machine is a, a virtual model of computation where we have the memory organized linearly as an infinite tape. And on this infinite tape, we move the head of which uh, does our operations. Uh, this, of course, a programming is complete hell. And uh, we have seen this in our assignments where we did real programming Turing machines. On the other side, it's uh, technically more powerful than a real computer because its memory is really infinite. It's potentially infinite. You can use any, each, any number of uh, input cells as if you wish, uh, all of your disposal. So uh, on the Turing machine, we did polynomial computations and we showed that uh, well, actually we formulated this polynomial church Turing thesis that says that the number of, uh, the, the polynomiality for Turing machines is the same as polynomiality for real computers. So uh, Using Turing machines, we could also define the NP class. We have two definitions. The first one was using non-deterministic computations. Non-deterministic computations means that uh, you can branch, and at some point, the machine doesn't know what to do, and the angel gives the hint. So the angel says that the machine uh, should do the following. And if the angel, the angel is always right, and if the machine didn't win, this means there was no good trajectory no help would be possible. And the other definition was in the term of hints, which is convenient for us. So we say that A of X, the solution for Turing for NP problem is one, if and only if there exists some Y such that R of X, Y equals one. And this R is polynomial and also Y should be polynomial in the size of this. This can be checked inside R. So uh, this is exactly what we had in satisfiability type problems because satisfiability exactly said there exists a satisfying assignment the check can be done polynomially. And uh, the problem is called, uh, we had the notion of reduction. So we had that the A is reducible to B. M reduction, which means that we compute something on the input of A and then we ask B for the answer. And if a B is such a problem, then any other problem is uh, 
are reducible to B, then this B is called NP complete, if B itself is an NP. And the main theorem here was this, I would write the, I would think I would change the color here. So that this theorem by Cook and Levin, which says that, uh, well, it, it's not three sat, it's just sat. That sat is NP complete. So it belongs to NP and is the hardest problem in the class. So any problem which is in NP can be reduced to sat. And by Satan, we know that three sat is also NP complete by Satan's transformations. So then we say that, so any A is MP reducible to SAT. This is reducible to 3 SAT by Satan's transformations. And therefore, um, this reduction can be conveyed by transitivity, and any problem from NP can be reduced to 3 SAT. The corollary is that if P is not equal, let me write it formally here. So the corollary that if P is not equal to NP, then SAT is not polynomially solvable because otherwise we will do any NP problem polynomially by this reduction. So Cook Levin just encoded the protocols of Turing machines. Now the interesting things which happen are um, the uh, what other problems can be proved to be hard in this sense. So now the idea is that we can reduce three sat to something and get um, new NP hard problems. And the example which we discussed at the lecture was the Hamiltonian path in oriented graphs. So it's this one is MP reducible to ham path. So again, for each formula phi, we obtain a graph G phi, which has a Hamiltonian path if and only if phi is satisfied. So satisfiability is reduced to phi is a three standard. Uh, so it's reduced to finding Hamiltonian paths in graphs. So recall that a graph is a diagram with vertices, some of them are connected. In this particular setting, the graph is directed. This means that uh, there are arrows on the um, on the edges of the graph, and uh, the arrows show us the direction which we have to go in. So the path is a path. I think you understand what it is. And a Hamiltonian path is a path which visits each vertex exactly. So uh, again, this is an NP problem. If we are given a path and checking it is Hamiltonian one, it's easy. But uh, it's NP hard. So guessing whether uh, the Hamiltonian path exists, it is hard. As uh, dually, the Euler path, which has to visit each edge exactly once, is polynomially time solved. So um, this is this looks like the duality between two set and three set, and we'll make this more formal on the seminar class today. I will um, uh, show just one thing. So uh, we had this. Uh, two coloring for graphs. So we have an undirected graph now. And the graph is, um, yeah, so the, uh, the graph is called correctly two colored if the vertices are colored in two colors and uh, vertices which are connected. So we have one vertex which is connected to another one and we have two colors say uh, blue and uh, red. So if we color this in blue then the connected vertex should be colored in red. We're not allowed to have two vertices of the same color being connected. And now what we're going to discuss, so what we discussed last time, so there was a problem, yeah. Two coloring is the same as being bipartite. So um, because a uh, bipartite graph is exactly a graph which can be split into two halves in the, all the edges are going between them. So the first is the blue and the red one. So uh, checking for two colorability is the same as checking for bipartiteness. And there was a problem in your home assignment, which was as follows. So check whether the given graph is bipartite. 
And uh, of course, you, um, many people gave uh, good solutions using searching algorithms, something like DFS or BFS, something like that. But what uh, is in the spirit of this course is just to prove this. It's just to prove that two color is reducible to two satisfiability. And this is done actually very easily because for each vertex you introduce. So this say this vertex is P, this vertex is Q, say green, blue is true, Q is false. And the thing which is disallowed, you are not allowed to have both P and Q true. So at least one should be false. And also, you should have at least one of them being true. And such pair of clauses should be introduced for each edge. So if you have another edge to R, then you will have to. So for a graph with the set of vertices PQR, etc. The graph of vertices. So this is a graph G. And this is the formula phi, phi G. All let's just call not phi, we don't really use phi. Let us call xi. Which is the following, and G is bipartite if and only if um, this formula is satisfied. So since two set is done by resolution method in polynomial time, two color is also polynomial. Now what about three color? This will be the topic of today's practical class. So I will not give you uh, the solution right now, but uh, one can see that three set is uh, somehow connected to three CNF, right? And actually you can do the same trick uh, by, uh, well, you can easily perform the following reduction. Well, uh, how can you do this? Well, for each vertex, you introduce three variables, P1, P2, P3, which correspond to the color in which the vertex is colored. And then you do something like P1 or Mm, yep, so you should first formulate that there is exactly one color. So this means that, um, say, uh, you sh P1 should imply not P2, P1 should imply not P3, etc. So this is a polynomial number of this that is exactly one color. So then all of this should be and with. Uh, P1 or P2 or P3. So each vertex should, uh, it cannot have two colors, but should have at least one. All of this stuff is 3CNF. And also you have to do this. So if P and Q are connected, then they cannot be of one color. So this means that P1 implies not Q1 is actually P2 implies not Q2, etc. And the same for vice versa. So this is a big number of clauses, but it's still a polynomial, so say no. So we have reduced to three coloring to three satisfiability. Is this something which we really should do? How do you think? What does this mean, by the way? So this means that if we can solve three sat in polynomial time, then we can solve three colorability in polynomial time. But this is useless because we know that three sat is hard. So this thing, actually, we have proved it by some reasoning, but actually this thing follows immediately from Cook Levin without any further proofs. Why? Because this is an NP problem, three coloring. And this is three sad. So by Cook Levin, this uh, reduces to sad and by Satan reduces to three sad. So this is the corollary of Cook Levin. It's nothing special. 
But what do we really want to do? If we want to show that three color is hot, how do you think? Yes, yes. Well, the, the real thing we need to do that we have to reduce three set to three color. We had the theory of NP completeness. It's recorded locally, no? Um, well, locally and locally, it's okay. And the completeness, so we had it on the notion of Boolean formulae and on uh, graphs. And finally, we discussed uh, some uh, problems connected to that, which are um, problems of uh, counting, problems of um, how do they call that? Problems of uh, search problems. So this was discussed today, so I will not pay much attention to that. And uh, this is the very grand end of our course. So um, as for the exams and stuff like that, please uh, look at the, I will stop sharing now. Yeah, please uh, take a look at the um, course's webpage, which is um, the official source of information uh, if you will have to pass the exam, which depends on your home assignments, I will try to check all of this by today's evening. Uh, then um, please uh, look at your email and at the course's webpage next uh, Wednesday in the morning, which will be your, uh, the final exam will be posted there and will be a deadline in the middle of the day. So it will be all online. So today is our last meeting in person here and on Zoom with the people who are connected uh, by online. So please be free to ask any questions and issues on my email. I will try to answer promptly, but as there are many assignments coming to me now, we'll please be patient for some delays. So thanks a lot for listening. And I, will ho I hope that we'll also record the seminar so, and uh, I'll do it on Zoom, so please stay tuned. And uh, um, thank you for listening, goodbye.